This video was brought to you by NordPass, who's giving my audience a discount with the coupon code JREVIEWS at the link nordpass.com slash JREVIEWS. That's just JREVIEWS, no S between the J and the R. As a part of their summer kickoff sale, users will save 70% off of a two-year premium plan plus one month free. NordPass is brought to you by the same team that created NordVPN, whom I worked with back when I did the Sonic Unleashed review in March. NordPass is a useful tool to have when surfing the internet because they store all your passwords in one place, meaning that you won't go through that time-consuming process of not remembering which password you used to sign into this website or that website since it's all right there. You can also use NordPass to generate more secure passwords with more complexity, increasing the safety of your account. Like I said, there are summer kickoff sales going on as we speak and will last from now to June 29th. 70% off at nordpass.com slash jreviews or the code jreviews. Like I said, that's just J reviews, no S between the J and the R. And with that said, let's get on with the show. So the talk of the town is the newly released Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart. Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart got announced at the PS5 reveal event, and this game raised many interesting questions for me as someone who's been playing the Ratchet & Clank series since I first played Going Commando in 2006. Before you comment, these are all my thoughts in the pre-release of Rift Apart. If you want to skip the preamble and just hear my spoiler-free impressions of Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, you can skip to this timestamp that's on the screen right now. Looking back, I always felt like the Ratchet & Clank series had a bunch of games, but in reality, a lot of those were side games or spin-offs. Ratchet & Clank Future, a crack in time, released all the way back in 2009, and in the time since, Rift Apart is the fifth game released, but only the second to where you'd feel like it's a big release. The first one to be a big release that takes place after a crack in time at all. I hate the fact that I'm old enough to say that I haven't played Ratchet & Clank All for One, Full Frontal Assault, and Into the Nexus in almost 10 years, but here we are. I never even beat the former two as a kid because I just didn't enjoy them that much. When they announced they were doing a remake of the first Ratchet & Clank, I was pretty excited as that was always one of my least favorites in the series, probably because it was the PS2 entry I played last. The remake was in truth a tie-in to the movie that bombed at the box office in 2016, but the game actually was a pretty big hit. In the years that followed, I was confident that the next Ratchet & Clank game would be a chronological sequel to 2016 given how much of a success it was. Into the Nexus might have ended with a sequel hook where the fate of the Dimensionator, a MacGuffin introduced in Tools of Destruction, was unknown, but I didn't feel like that mattered that much going forward because Full Frontal Assault and Into the Nexus were both just very low-key games. The market at that point, 2012 and 2013, had completely shifted to the shooter dominance that began in the mid-2000s, with Ratchet 2016 being the first time the series had a mainstream hit in years and the biggest success the series and the company had seen up to that point. I felt like it would be weird to go back to the original continuity that kept going on and on since 2002. I didn't think for sure it would be a remake of Ratchet & Clank 2, but I thought they would stick with the new continuity at the very least, which brings us to the announcement of Rift Apart. At first, I thought it was still the movie-verse, given the fact that Ratchet's appearance is consistent with that one, even if it's just the Tools of Destruction look but altered. Dr. Nefarious was back as the villain, and while he was a robot, that could have followed the sequel hook from the film where he was transformed into Nefarious we all know. Later, it was confirmed that we're back in the original continuity with this game as the Dimensionator's back as the leading MacGuffin but it would not require having played the entire backlog of the series in order to understand. This is a pretty effective compromise, since fans who didn't like 2016 can rest easy knowing we're back in familiar territory, and new fans, with people reintroduced to the series via 2016, can rest easy as well. However, I didn't feel like that would really mean a change from 2016's tone was coming. Not enough was really shown to speak decisively on that matter, though. When looking at the larger series, just look at the cartoon pilot that dropped a couple months ago. Insomniac didn't do this, but I think there are some takeaways from this 22-minute, uh, experience that apply to the series as a whole. Like a standardized roster of joke weapons that date back to Tools of Destruction, lame Pizza Planet-based gags, Nefarious being in it to pull a wacky scheme, because of course he is. All things I thought Ratchet 2016 got wrong as well. My biggest fear with the series in the run-up to Rift Apart's release was Ratchet & Clank's longevity. The series from game to game was an ongoing story, and while each game ended with room for more, stories aren't meant to go on forever. With Ratchet & Clank basically being Sony's go-to cartoon platformer, I feel like there's been an effort to produce Ratchet & Clank iconography. I assume this is why the weapon roster from Tools of Destruction was the default loadout for Ratchet & All for One, Full Frontal Assault, and 2016, even though that was supposed to be a remake of the 2002 game. It's boiling Ratchet & Clank down to a couple of key elements and bringing them back like the Groovatron or Dr. Nefarious flailing about as the villain. Because they want Nefarious to be the Eggman or the Bowser of Ratchet & Clank. Dr. Nefarious' appearance in the Ratchet & Clank film and 2016 game show off why I think his character is flawed after seeing him for all these years. He's a joke villain with three jokes, Malfunctions, Yelling, and Lawrence. 
2016 having him shoehorned into the plot is already bad enough, but then Lawrence isn't there and he's not a robot, so all he does is yell and it's just not that funny. Listen to this infobot. You've been selected for the beta trial of my latest invention. GSK81, get back! Why is he yelling that line? Like, seriously, I don't get it. So going into this game, there are obviously some things in the pre-release that I wasn't liking as much. However, there also were some signs of improvement. I mean, Rift Apart seems to have abandoned the god-awful in-game cutscenes from Ratchet 2016, so that's an instant plus. My overall point being that with all the stuff I was seeing, I was inconclusive on how I thought the game was going to turn out, so I was very willing to go into it and just judge it on its own merits. And I also feel as though that perspective is informed by how, since I last talked about Ratchet & Clank, a lot has changed about myself and the series. In 2018, Insomniac Games dropped Marvel's Spider-Man. I went into that game basically blind, I had no idea what the plot was going to be, and I thought it was stellar. And that's speaking as someone who's played almost all these open-world Spider-Man games since Spider-Man 2 and the PlayStation 2. Web-slinging felt really good, combat was fun, production value was great, story was really human, exactly what I want from Spider-Man just in video game form. For this video, I played through all of Spider-Man Remastered, and I can say with confidence that I think Spider-Man's one of the best games of last generation. The 60 FPS and ray tracing updates on PS5, as well as having next to zero loading times, make it even better than it was on PS4. Basically, it felt like a new game because of all that. Seriously though, 30 FPS. Oh, the humanity. With Spider-Man, I was really happy for Insomniac. Ratchet 2016 was the most popular game at the time of its release, but two years later, Spider-Man flies past it and becomes their best-selling game, so I'm glad they got to continue that success with last year's Miles Morales game that I haven't finished yet, but has been fun thus far and demonstrates graphical and animation improvements over Spider-Man Remastered in ways you wouldn't think were necessary, but really help. Showing that in terms of console performance, this generation is shaping up to be a much bigger leap than the previous one was over its predecessors. Credit to Insomniac, they actually went back and patched Ratchet & Clank 2016 on PlayStation 5, giving it a boost to 60 FPS. This also makes the game feel new, but after playing it again, it's really weird. I was blown away by Spider-Man 2018 on PS5, this being my third playthrough of the game, but this was also my third playthrough of Ratchet 2016 and it was much different. I haven't touched Ratchet 2016 since it came out. I played it at launch and then I played it for the review that came out a month later. Looking back at that original review, I can't believe it's been five years. It was my ninth review and I was only a freshman in high school back then with 61 subscribers to my name. A lot can change in five years, it really can. It's interesting to see that I actually criticized the game at launch for issues that will be made popular later like the NPCs being non-existent, the Rangers adding nothing, Ratchet and Clank having no character, and Nefarious being completely shoehorned in. It's weird to look back on because my tone regarding the game was still a lot more positive than it is today. At the time, I was just happy to see a game in the series being fun to play in spite of its problems, hence my saying it was the best the series had done since a crack in time. But I think there's a reason why I never thought to come back to this game even once in five years. Like I said, 60 FPS felt nice to have, but it was in service of what might be the blandest Ratchet and Clank game ever made. Speaking of performance, I would like to make a statement. I'm really not that hard to please here. I don't need 4K resolution. I'd take 1080p with no ray tracing if it meant a solid 60 FPS performance. Metal Gear Solid 5, Devil May Cry 5, and Resident Evil 2 Remake are some of my favorite games of last generation, and silky smooth gameplay is a big factor here. The way I see it, critiquing Uncharted 4 for having its multiplayer in 60 FPS and its campaign locked at 30, or Ratchet 2016 for its 30 FPS and motion blur, leads to Spider-Man and The Last of Us 2, where the games come with more options where you can turn off motion blur or change the degree of the blur. Now on PS5, we have options for motion blur and options to lower the resolution to achieve 60 FPS. I feel as though we don't get these things with complacency. Criticizing the games results in the players having better features. If you want to see just how much has changed in the expectations of console games in the last five years, look at the options menu in Miles Morales and Spider-Man Remastered and compare that to the sheer nothing in the options menu of Ratchet 2016. Back to Ratchet & Clank 2016 as a game, the whole thing feels like it's propped up by its graphics. The lighting and textures look really good in this game, but the rest of it just felt really off. The gameplay is just more of the same as Tools of Destruction and Onwards with uninspired level design, when the levels aren't aping off the original game, that is. With a lot of the same weapons brought back like the Combustor, the Buzz Blades, the Fusion Grenade, the Predator Launcher, and the Pyro Blaster, relying on the same gimmick weapons we've been seeing since Tools of Destruction like the Groovatron and Mr. Zircon, joke weapons that they've had a fetish for, at this point, over a decade. By the time you're fighting a giant Zircon Mama in 2016, you really have to ask how we got to this point, how this is compelling humor. It wants to kill, spam that joke over and over for 10 years and you have Zircon. 
Something as simple as the fish tries to kill you for going too far out of bounds trope turns into this. Like, what is happening here? None of the in-game scenes look great, but the early ones certainly aren't terrible for 2016 standards. But by the middle of the game, it's just the most generic A cam B cam setup you'll ever see where characters lifelessly look forward in these stilted conversations. This high angle shot shows Ratchet and Clank both looking at the A camera and not the guy they're talking to. And the writing is even worse than I said back in 2016. It goes without saying that the game's idea of humor is as self-aware as possible and it drives me crazy. Like when Quark sends Ratchet to Nebula G34 to die, it's so obvious when he's talking about how closely he's following Ratchet, but then gets mad at the referee in the game he's watching. Like, wow, it's so funny how obvious it is that Quark's contradicting his words with his actions. Spam that joke like five times in this one stage. Or this part with Drek. That Drek Industries is working for you. Drek Industries is not working for you. Like, wow, he just completely contradicted himself. Look how obvious we're being. We are so self-aware of how this is a dumb game for kids. No disrespect to the actors here, because bringing characters to life without facial expression is a really hard job, especially when you're in a booth recording lines without being able to react to the other actors. It's challenging work. I respect it. But honestly, forget the jokes. The worst part of the entire game is the fact that the in-game dialogue is near endless. I don't have a consistent rule on this, as in Spider-Man I thought the character conversations in-game were interesting character building, or just the usual quips you'd expect from Spider-Man. In this game, it's non-stop quips and remarks that add nothing to the game, like uh-oh, out of ammo, or he's using a pyrocitor, or I hope Rift Apart allows you to turn that off, because if they don't, then damn, Sonic Forces has one up on Ratchet and Clank. By the end of it, I couldn't say Ratchet 2016 is bad, it's just really bland. Ratchet and HD just didn't impress me that much, and with it being the same levels and weapons I've played on and used before, the game doesn't have any definitive staying power. It's a similar issue to Tools of Destruction, but I'd say it's worse because at least the content in that game was new. Here, it just feels like you're going through the motions, and with that said, I can say pretty easily that I won't be playing Ratchet and Clank 2016 anytime soon. The year is 2021. The last time I talked about Ratchet and Clank on my channel was 2017. Like I said when discussing Spider-Man, a lot has changed. The Ratchet & Clank retrospective I started in 2016 never properly finished, seeing as the last video was a crack in time, so I never got to all for one for Frontal Assault or Into the Nexus. This has of course led to fans wondering when I would get to it, and I never had a solid answer to that question because my schedule's always been full of other videos I'd rather be making than that. Another problem that came up with my reviewing the rest of the series was the older videos themselves. You'd think I'd hate the oldest ones the most, because that's just how it is with being a creator. The older the work, the less you like it. But I actually think my oldest videos have some charm to them. Not good or fun to watch, but charming in the sense that with each video, you can see me trying new things and getting better at doing it each time. My review on Ratchet 1 in particular is funny to watch, because I literally have almost no idea what I'm even saying half the time, because the audio balance is terrible, and the speed of the voiceover is insane. But like I said, I find that pretty charming. We've got a blaster, a rocket launcher, and a bomb glove. Ratchet's main form of defense is his wrench, which he can do a three-hit combo with. It's more the videos between old and new that I often hate the most. Here you have this 16, 17-year-old kid being a pretentious douchebag, thinking he's so analytical because his videos are like 30 minutes to an hour each, even if there isn't that much material to work with. And the videos have problems like low bit rates, summary, off-color footage, bad audio quality, or if it's mostly montages. Like seriously, my review of Mega Man X7 has a shorter script than X5, but it's like 10 minutes longer because of montages. In most of my videos from 2017, I think it's pretty visible how high my horse was. I'm talking down to people in my slide 2 review because I am the expert. When the video just watches like a Wikipedia summary for 65% of its runtime, to what is easily the worst example, the videos in the future trilogy. In a crack in time, I decided to go with this angle that the game wasn't long enough for my standards. Like, bro. You're 16, what the fuck are you talking about? Making mountains out of sheer molehills like blink and you miss it radio dialogue or one-off jokes about your father's accountant. Most of my favorite games aren't even that long, but I keep coming back to them because they're fun. My giving a crack in time shit for not being long enough just comes off as a desperate attempt to look analytical at all costs. Something I at least tried to abandon in more recent videos. Just saying how I feel because what other reason is there to be doing this series in the first place? Now that I've finally gotten the chance to air my grievances with some of my work, it does beg the question, how many of those videos do I intend to redo? Well, several actually, but Ratchet & Clank is a hard one because when looking at the future series in particular, I don't disagree with a lot of my takes, it's just the presentation of those takes that's the terrible part. 
For example, the whole thing is framed around the idea that the capitalist satire of the PS2 Ratchet games is gone. This is a fact, but the videos look at the future series from a perspective that different means the series is ruined. We can have preferences on how to do something, but it's of far more value to look at how the future games try to be more cinematic. But back on subject, I suppose if there's demand I could do those videos again, but I don't think it's too necessary to spend time on with Rift Apart being out. With all that said and done, what was the point of the last several minutes anyway? Well, going into Rift Apart, which I picked up as soon as I could on Friday afternoon, I thought it was important to have played Ratchet 2016 again and gotten a fresh opinion on it, the PS5 60fps patch providing great incentive to play it again. When doing this video, the last 15 minutes was made over a month ago now, I thought it was important to tell you how I currently feel about Ratchet 2016. I wanted to talk about how I felt about Rift Apart in the pre-release, and I thought the best way to do it would be to write about it before the game was out to get an accurate reflection of how I felt going in, regardless of how wrong I may or may not have been come release date. Because I haven't enjoyed Ratchet's new games in a long time, and I wanted to address what has changed since 2017 with the Spider-Man games and how I felt about my old videos. Writing it all out like that cements that I think all of those things are important backstory when discussing my thoughts on this game. But it does also show why I don't really do speculation type videos. The segment on Rift Apart's pre-release is dated already just by virtue of the game being out. But I decided to make an exception this time and leave it in speculation because I think it adds an interesting question to the video. As a longtime fan of the series who wasn't too hyped about this game before it dropped for various reasons just described, how'd I feel about it after having played it? Well, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart was really goddamn good. Yeah, I'm serious. No strings attached. This game was great even making me feel like I should go back and give some of these games another chance. The following segment is ultimately just going to be a spoiler-free, here's how I felt type video, and I'm doing that for two reasons. The first being that I don't have time to make a big Rift Apart video right now. I mean, this is my first video in over a month. I need to get back to working on my big project as soon as I can, which I'll announce at the end of the video. The other reason I can reveal in a moment. I beat the game, but I stopped recording footage two and a half hours in so that I couldn't even show anything spoiler-related if I felt so inclined. Just stick into early game footage here. Not recording footage is how I prefer to enjoy new games anyway, I can just sit down and play them. When looking at this game, yeah, it's absolutely stunning. The lighting, the environments, they all look fantastic. Ratchet's face when he's covered in water looks really bizarre though, but that's the exception. I, of course, played with performance ray tracing on, and now that we have ray tracing with 60 FPS, I don't really feel like added resolution is a strong incentive to play in fidelity mode, but hey, what do I know? Like I was saying earlier in the video, the expectations of console games have come really far in the last five years as this game has a whole host of accessibility options for different players and that has seemingly become an industry standard, which is a great thing. My footage does not do the game justice, you'd have to see it with your own eyes to get how good this game looks. The PlayStation 5 is a beast when it comes to hardware. This is a game where you can pick a planet, you could take off, and you'll be there in nanoseconds. The 7th and 8th gen consoles were terrible with loading screens in between major chunks of gameplay and I think that aspect of older games will look really dated with how far things have come with one console leap. The PS5 controller is excellently used in this game. I mean, you'll be firing your weapons and they'll add some resistance to the button presses when shooting so it adds weight to all your shots and that's really satisfying. The controls felt really responsive as the third person shooter control scheme that started back in Up Your Arsenal has only been refined in the years since that game came out. With this game having great options like being able to change which shoulder the camera is following with the press of a button. In general, this game's combat mechanics are a vast improvement over Ratchet 2016. And this comes down to three things. One, the area you fight your enemies in are a lot better designed with enemies being above and below you, as well as ammo vendors feeling pretty scarce in this game. At first, I was thinking this was a flaw I had with the game. But when you think about it, combat becomes more engaging when you need to rely on ammo crates and have to use the less powerful weapons. The Zircon Mama from Ratchet 2016 might have been an okay boss, but there is literally a vendor you can just go to and have all your health and ammo restored in a second and it really cheapens all the difficulty. Rift Apart also adds new moves like the Rift Tether. I didn't think I'd use this much, but when dodging enemies it's really useful to be able to just move to a higher vantage point in a second. The Shadow Dash being one of the best additions as the enemies and bosses can now attack you more directly and you have to dodge with the Shadow Dash. It's really fun to use, always made me think of how a 3D Mega Man X game could handle. And then that gets you to think about how badly they drop the ball with Mega Man X7. All the weapons you work with are really fun. I won't go too far into them since I only played this once, but I think my point about weapons from earlier is validated by this game. Take the blaster from this game, for example. It has a slower start, but then just starts spewing bullets everywhere after a couple seconds. It's a new weapon. It feels satisfying with the controller, it has great mechanics, and is a good weapon for the entire game with a natural rate of fire. The Combustor was never a great weapon, even back in Tools of Destruction, but after seeing this lame weapon get used so often, it becomes even worse. 
Old weapons are in Rift Apart, but like Going Commando or Up Your Arsenal, this is a supplement to the already fantastic and satisfying roster of weapons. Going into a new Ratchet, getting the feel of new weapons is the best part, regardless of whether or not the archetypes themselves are familiar. I feel like Raritanium weapon upgrades should go, however, if they make another one. This was a mechanic introduced in Tools of Destruction that I never thought much of until JebTube's new video on it. When playing Rift Apart, I noticed that the Raritanium upgrades are the ones I cared about, like Maximum Ammo Capacity and Rate of Fire. By comparison, the actual weapon level ups that come by using them feel pretty superfluous. I don't even really know what a level 3 burst pistol does that a level 2 version wasn't already doing. This will just come as a post-production update, but I was talking to my friend about the Raritanium level upgrades and all that stuff, and he told me that with each level up is what unlocks more things on the skill tree for the Raritanium upgrades. And somehow I completely did not notice this when playing the game, so... Uh, in just regards to what changes about that, I still feel like the actual level ups aren't that exciting to get. It just feels like a free ammo increase as opposed to like feeling like, oh, like a Ratchet 2 where you just get an upgrade. And it's like, oh, the weapon is like completely changed. It's way more fun to use. Even in like Up Your Arsenal with the five version upgrades, it's still pretty fun to get in any of the upgrades from one to five. Whereas in Rift Apart, I don't know. It just doesn't feel as exciting. Back to the video. I joked earlier about how it would be nice to be able to just shut off the in-game dialogue, but that's one accessibility option that is not present. However, I do get why. Shutting off in-game dialogue across the board would mean the player loses needed story context as characters do discuss important things and develop relationships in the gameplay. I totally wanted to tear my ears off when Zircon Jr. said literally anything, but it's a trade-off I'm willing to make while playing the game. Because those character moments are there. The story and cutscenes might have been the biggest surprise of all. The game's story is really well done. Right at the start, I thought the basic premise of it having been a long time since Into the Nexus was pretty validating. I mean, in real life, it has been eight years since the last Ratchet & Clank adventure, and it's been about that long in canon. It just kind of feels like the series is growing with you. The old adventures we grew up with are nostalgic in-universe, too. My prediction that the series is meant to go on forever is proven false in the first ten minutes of the game. In fact, all my predictions were wrong, as Nefarious was actually pretty good in this, something I was not expecting to say. You could argue that his being fed up with always losing is a hackneyed idea, and that's actually what I think works about it. Nefarious is kind of pathetic as a villain by this point, and it's the thing that starts the story. Like I said, I'm not trying to give away a lot of details, but everything I complained about at the start of the video did not come true. I thought Nefarious was really good and funny. What they do with the Dimensionator works. The characters both old and new are great, and the cutscene direction is fantastic. Such an improvement over 2016. Unfortunately, to buy into the story of Rift Apart, you have to buy into the story of Tools of Destruction, as it keeps that last Lombax drama going. But, I can't really say the devs did a wrong thing here. I mean, they went back to the original canon and dealt with the story that comes with that, and I respect that. I really enjoyed the story of this game as a result of all these things. Speaking of Tools of Destruction, that game is the other reason why I'm not jumping the gun on calling this a full Rift Apart review. These are my knee-jerk reactions to Rift Apart when the game is less than a week old. For this brand spanking new console I just got, no less. If you were to take me as I am today and teleport me back to 2007, I think it's entirely possible that my Tools of Destruction review looks quite similar to this. Ratchet & Clank Future Tools of Destruction released this week, and I must say, it is absolutely out of this world. I'm a big fan of the games we've gotten the PlayStation 2, and this year we've gotten two new additions to the roster. Ratchet & Clank Size Matters, which continued the series' high standards, but this time on a handheld. And now, the series makes its proper next-generation debut with Tools of Destruction. Right away, you can feel just how much more could be done with the PS3 compared to the PS2, as the first levels show buildings blowing up and enemy fire going everywhere you go. The graphics and effects in this game look absolutely spectacular and mop the floor with what Up Your Arsenal was doing just three years ago. They even take advantage of the unique capabilities of the PS3's controller by allowing you to use it to steer Ratchet and Clank while falling and with weapons like the Tornado Launcher and these puzzle segments. Combine this with a more in-depth story relating to Ratchet's past and heritage and you have a PS3 exclusive you cannot miss. Do you see what I mean? Reviewing Tools of Destruction today is completely different from how it was back in 2007. The graphics of that game are not new anymore. The weapons were never that fun to use. So in hindsight, I hold a lot more against Tools of Destruction because its lame roster of weapons got used in so many games. And because its attempts to be cinematic with the introduction of the last Lombax storyline has been the elephant in the room for the entire rest of the series, including Rift Apart, a game released 14 years after Tools of Destruction, I just don't think that game has aged particularly well. This is why I do the How Does It Hold Up segment on more recent titles. It's not because a year-old game is expected to be dated, but I do think the hype surrounding games can cloud the vision of that game on the first playthrough. 
I'm not saying I'm above this or speaking for everyone, I just think it's interesting to go back to games that were so hyped and talk about them after the dust has settled and see if I liked it as much as I did when it first came out. So in about a year, I will give Rift Apart a full review and we'll see how I feel about it then. However, I do think this game will age a lot better than Tools of Destruction or Ratchet 2016. I mean, the 6-axis stuff in TOD is a complete gimmick in hindsight, but the controller stuff in Rift Apart actually feels really good when playing the game. Rift Apart also does a great job with its story without needing to come at the cost of the other games. 2016 was a game I was happy to play when it came out because it was a new, full-length Ratchet game and there hadn't been one in like 7 years at the time, but I played it at launch and then crawled through it the second time for the video a month later because I don't think it has much replay value, as shown by my having never touched it again in 5 years. Rift Apart, on the other hand, is a game I already want to go back to and keep getting more out of on challenge mode, which I definitely will do in my downtime. I don't know if this will be the last Ratchet & Clank, I mean Up Your Arsenal and A Crack in Time both served as games I thought the series could go out on, but I felt an air of finality with this one. I'm sure they'd make another one if Ratchet kept proving itself as a successful brand, but whether they do or don't, I'm all aboard the Insomniac train. I loved Spider-Man and I really enjoyed Rift Apart. You guys don't know how happy I am to say I really enjoyed the latest work in a series I grew up with. This game proves to me that I'm not just crazy with something like Ratchet 2016, I just didn't like the game. It's not that the series isn't for me, it's just that I want a solidly executed game like Rift Apart. But anyway, I mentioned downtime a moment ago, which does raise the question of what I need downtime from, and the answer is the big project I'm working on right now. The one that has been well underway since that Sonic Rivals review came out in early May. It's been five years since I first started reviewing Ratchet & Clank, and I thought there was no time like the present to go back and do it again. Ratchet & Clank 1, 2, 3, Deadlocked, and Size Matters, done over from the ground up in my current style. If you followed me on Patreon, you would know that as of this upload, I have re-reviewed Ratchet & Clank 1, 2, and 3, and the patrons have had access the whole time. I'm working on Deadlocked by the time you see this. The re-review of Ratchet 1 will drop next Saturday on June 26th. Each of these reviews will drop on the following Saturdays, July 3rd for Ratchet 2, July 10th for Ratchet 3, July 17th for Ratchet Deadlocked, and July 24th for Size Matters. If you join the Patreon right now, you can get access to the entire trilogy over a week before the first episode drops. Deadlock will probably be finished before then, with Size Matters probably being done before Ratchet 2 drops. You don't have to join, but if you do, you get to join the exclusive Discord server and talk about all things gaming and videos by yours truly. But if that's not enough, I'm introducing the first stretch goal to the Patreon. If we at any point reach $200 a month, I will re-review Secret Agent Clank, the game that I gave the most negative review this channel has ever seen. But this time, we're going back to finish the job. But anyway, I think that's enough for this video. If you join the Patreon, I'll see you there. Otherwise, I'll be back in a week and a half for the Ratchet 1 re-review. I hope you enjoyed my ramblings throughout this video, and with that said, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.